It's Thursday, September 24. This is the news on PBCJ. I'm Carol Francis. The new cases of COVID-19 as well as deaths in Jamaica keep racking up, taxing an already stretched healthcare system. Here are the latest figures from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. As at Thursday morning, Jamaica's COVID-19 death toll stands at 77 after one new death was reported. The latest mortality is a 58-year-old female of a Manchester address. 193 new positive cases were also reported. This brings the island's total case number to 5,588. 46 recoveries were reported over the past 24 hours, and that total now stands at 1,490. That leaves us with 3,939 active cases. It was also disclosed that there are 37 moderately ill and 8 critically ill patients. A total of 113 persons are now hospitalized, while 16 persons are quarantined in a government facility, and 23,483 are quarantined at home. At this time, there are 472 imported cases and 268 cases of local transmission, while 740 are contacts of confirmed cases, 236 are associated with the St. Catherine Workplace Cluster, and 3,872 cases are under investigation. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Gabrielle Thompson. $1.7 billion. That's how much it will cost the government to provide electronic devices like tablets and laptops, computers for some students at the primary and secondary levels. The expenditure comes as the October 5 resumption of schools draw near, with the physical reopening of schools a no-no. Owing to the ongoing pandemic spike, electronic learning is being pushed as a credible option. Speaking at a digital press briefing this week, Minister of Education, Youth and Information Favel Williams gave the details. In terms of tablets in school, just to mention it again, following deliberations concerning the approach to be used for distribution of tablets procured by e-learning, it was agreed that e-learning would assume the full distribution of the 40,000 tablets. And these tablets will be focused on students in PATH in our primary schools, and we'll be emphasizing grades four to six. We will be purchasing an additional 25,000 devices, devices, and these will be targeted for grades 10 to 13, again with an emphasis on PATH students. And as already said, e-learning has confirmed that they have completed the distribution of tablets to teachers. In terms of the total overall that will be spent on, on tablets and laptops, it's roughly $1.7 billion. In the meantime, Minister Williams says the training of teachers in the online learning management system continues. Teacher training through UWI Open Campus, Micro University, Northern Caribbean University, Delaware University, and Waldorf Universities remain ongoing. The Jamaica Teaching Council has ongoing training and professional development webinars for teachers in the following areas. The blended approach using the STEM methodology, G Suite to include Google Classroom, which is the same as the learning management system. Over 20,000 teachers have already been trained and it will continue. As the travel and tourism industry looks to navigate the challenges of the current COVID-19 pandemic towards recovery, Jamaica's Minister of Tourism, Edmund Bartlett, has announced the creation of a tourism supply hub. The aim is to position Jamaica as the premier logistics center in the region for training and certification of tourism workers, supplies for crews and airlines, and resilience and technology support. The plans for the Tourism Supply Hub was unveiled at the Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association 59th Annual General Meeting. More from Marlon Samuels. Cruise line executives and industry leaders have reportedly been discussing new policies to chart the course for the resumption of cruising. Among the comprehensive and layered approach being taken is the need for supplies and workers. Jamaica is also positioning itself for resumption of cruising. There are plans to promote Jamaica as a supply hub. 
The Supply Hub will provide trained, certified workers and technology support. This would be a response to the cruise companies uh, which have indicated that they would like to secure supplies from Jamaica as well as additional workers. And just to indicate to you that we have been in long discussions with our cruise partners, and although I cannot announce to you today the exact date when cruise will resume in Jamaica, I can tell you that we have been very vigorous in terms of our efforts to redefine the relationships between ourselves and the crews uh, with the hope of ensuring that a greater level of, um, of, of not just uh, resources will come to Jamaica, but that Jamaica will benefit greater from the uh, ability that the cruise lines have to generate more local involvement and more inclusiveness in terms of the returns from their sector of the industry. The Ministry of Tourism is also putting in place a team of tourism recovery experts. You will recall that at the beginning we had set up the Tourism Recovery Risk Management Team. That team will evolve into this new um, uh, collaborative force, as I'm calling it. Uh, it will not be as big as the team that we had before, but it will consist of a number of the players who are there and some other experts that we'll be bringing on board. I'll have more to say on that for you at a later date. So um, the, the expectation is that this team will comprise about nine members, including three industry players and representatives from the private sector, JMA, E, the bankers, and from the health sector. Plans are also underway for a global marketing campaign to promote a robust and a responsible reopening of Jamaica's tourism industry based on the country's COVID-19 protocols. For the news on PBCJ, I'm Marlon Samuels. The World Health Organization, WHO, global leaders and vaccine producers are currently grappling with the question of how to allocate a vaccine for COVID-19 when it has been identified and who should get it first. Director of the Pan American Health Organization, PAHO, Carissa Etienne, believes frontline workers should be the first priority. The PAHO director warns that even as a vaccine is rolled out, COVID-19 will continue to spread and people will continue to get sick. So governments must continue to implement the best treatment plans and prepare to dispense the vaccine. The truth is, countries cannot wait to have all of the answers before they start planning and preparing to deliver a COVID vaccine. So preparations for the vaccine against COVID-19 will not be easy, but our region has a strong legacy of immunization programs that give us a leg up as we plan for the future. Because time is of the essence, we must work together. And that is why we believe that the COVAX facility convened by Gavi, CEPI, and WHO will afford countries in our region the best opportunity to fast track access to COVID-19 vaccines and to reduce the impact of the pandemic on people's lives and our economies. Ms. Etienne says PAHO will be supporting countries in monitoring vaccine safety and effectiveness over time. The goal of early vaccination could be to reduce deaths and suffering from this virus and to minimize the risk of infection while protecting our health systems overall. And that is why it is recommended that frontline health workers, first responders, and those caring for the elderly would be vaccinated first, followed by vulnerable groups such as adults with pre-existing conditions especially those over 65 years of age. She says preparation includes determining these groups early and identifying how to contact them quickly. Scheduling of vaccination is also important. Just as essential services are being offered outside of traditional settings, vaccination strategies must be designed to minimize the strain on our clinics and hospitals without sacrificing 
convenience and access. To ensure vaccination sites aren't overwhelmed, they must have adequate staff, resources, and equipment in place. Scheduling will also be important to control foot traffic and maintain social distancing. The success of vaccination also rests on how information is shared. Governments must provide clear guidance about the vaccines and their vaccination strategies to instill trust and to minimize confusion. Misinformation during vaccination activities costs lives. The PAHO boss says it may take time before people are vaccinated, so individuals are being urged to continue safety practices. Simone Absalom reporting for the news on PBCJ. The Consumer Affairs Commission CAC is urging consumers to educate themselves about the various ways to shop safely amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Chief Executive Officer of the CAC, Dulcie Allen, says consumers should prepare and plan before undertaking their shopping, thus minimizing outdoor activities and possible exposure to the virus. Plan before. We speak to persons, we know exactly where the, what, where the stores are. We can get prices. And also, we get, a lot of them offer online um, facilities in terms of pricing and, and those types of things, yes, availability. And we also, they do ads in the papers. You can look at the ads. And also the Consumer Fair Commission, we do have prices of so many items on our website and on our app. And we encourage you to utilize those facilities. She also encouraged collaborating with family members or friends and buying items in bulk. Many times we get a discount because we all know we have to manage the little resources that we have. Yes, yes. So when you're comparing, what we find is that each time, depending on where you are, the price is maybe two, three hundred dollars more in another place. You have to ensure that you plan your activities, plan your route. Because if it is that one book, for example, or one item for this back to school or any item at all, is say a hundred dollars less in a particular area. You have to calculate if it's worth your while to drive or to take bus, whatever the mode of transportation is to go to that place for that one item. If it's a group of items now, then certainly you can know how to plan your, plan your business. And, 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 and you can also go, it depends on when you're going out, plan your route. So you shop on the, at the places where you know these prices are. And you know, over a period of time, we know exactly where to get the bargains as consumers. And because we, we shop all the time and we have an idea of those that are extremely expensive and those that are more reasonable. Yeah. So we ask that you utilize that information. Yeah. The Consumer Affairs Commission was established to inform, educate, and empower consumers to protect themselves in the marketplace. With the introduction of a new policy, motorists with outstanding traffic tickets will soon be barred from renewing their driver's license, as well as acquiring fitness certificates and similar services until they have paid outstanding tickets. This according to National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang. He made the announcement while speaking at a sensitization session on the new handheld devices for the traffic ticketing management system in Port Maria St. Mary. Over $40 million have been spent to implement a pilot program island-wide to remedy the traffic ticketing issue. The ministry's transformation team continues its sensitization sessions in Portland, Westmoreland and Hanover. Global oil prices have stabilized after some recent volatility. However, locally, motorists will see an increase in gas and diesel prices when they go to the pumps. Gabriel Thompson looks at those and other market news in the business report. According to the latest ex-refinery costs from Petrojam, motorists should see an increase at the pumps in the prices of gasoline and diesel, effective Thursday, September 24. Following an increase of 25 cents each, 87 and 90 octane gasoline will be sold for $113.20 and $116.03 per liter, respectively. Automotive diesel fuel will be sold for $109.66 per liter, following an increase of 25 cents, while ultra-low sulfur diesel is also up by 25 cents and will be sold for $112.47 per liter. Meanwhile, kerosene saw a price increase of 25 cents and will be sold for $86.90 per liter. 
Propane liquid petroleum will be sold for $47.09 per litre, up by 25 cents. And butane liquid petroleum will be sold for $52.75 per litre, following an increase of 25 cents. Marketing companies and retailers will add their respective markup to these prices. In Wednesday's trading session, the JSE Combined Index declined by 544 points to close at under 400,000 units. Overall, market activity resulted from trading in 69 stocks, of which 28 advanced, 31 declined, and 10 traded firm. The Junior Market Index advanced by 24 points to close at under 3,000 units. Stocks advanced for AMG Packaging and Paper Company, Barita Investments Limited, and Cargo Handlers Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica, Access Financial Services, and Berger Paints Jamaica. Trading firm were 1834 Investments Limited, Community and Workers of Jamaica Deferred Share, and Epley Limited 8.25%. Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares was the volume leader with 18.4 million units, followed by Sajikor Real Estate X Fund Limited with 3.5 million units and Pulse Investments Limited with 2.4 million units. Now for the foreign exchange. The US dollar on Wednesday, September 23 ended trading at $142.62. The Canadian dollar sold for an average $107.53. The pound sterling traded for $183.09, and the euro ended trading at $168.12. Oil prices steadied on Thursday as a fall in U.S. inventories last week was tempered by a stronger dollar and a renewed wave of COVID-19 cases in Europe that led several countries to reimpose travel restrictions. Brent crude futures gained $0.10 cents to $41.87 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate Crude Futures rose $0.08 cents to $40.01 a barrel. Both benchmarks traded lower earlier in the session. That's it for this edition of the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. In this episode of Culinary Trails, host Simone Absalom makes a stop at Chris's Kitchen Home-Based Catering Services in Portmore, St. Catherine. a wide variety of seafood from fish to shrimp dishes to the seafood ball as I told you about but if you want the crab alone if you want the crayfish alone conch we offer them all as lot along with you know your fish with your bami your festival um, green plantain so we offer that on Fridays and Saturdays I only operate those two days for now because as, as I said before I have a regular nine to five so operation is on the weekends. But Friday, I mainly prepare for lunch. So I'll um, cook for and deliver for lunchtime on Fridays in Kingston and in Portmore. On Saturdays is a pickup only. So we cook your order, you cook it, you just come by and pick it up. Whether you want the shrimp, if you don't want, I mean, all the contents of the boil is, you can get it individually. So if you want a curry shrimp dish, if you want um, corn cologne, and a lot of persons love the shrimp dishes that I do, whether the curry shrimp, I also have a sweet and spicy shrimp that persons love, persons have ordered the crab by themselves. So it's mainly seafood for now. It's, Chrissy, it's Chrissy's Kitchen because I didn't want to limit myself as Chrissy's seafood because knowing me, I'll venture into other things. So if you want me to cook some curry goats, I'll do it. Well, I do offer catering, but I, I have done catering since I started. As my seafood balls that I provide, I have a wide range, whether you're serving one person, whether it's two persons. So I have right now a standard, a small, medium, and a large seafood boil. The large boil is a large 
the Lois Paltry container. Some persons who have ordered it for a party, some persons ordered two, have done as much as three in one day. And so, yes, I can, I can, because the, the large boil hovers up to 10, can share up to 10 persons. So, so far, I think I've catered to a, a 30 person group, but I definitely know I can do more if, if it's required. Presentation, I mean, is, is, is important. I eat with my eyes. If it don't look good, I'm not going to eat it. So for me, in starting Chris's Kitchen, it was about presenting it the way I would want it. So I ensured that I got my labels done. As I said, I just started in May. And the way it has taken off is really exceptional. Persons love the packaging. They love how the food is served. They love how it looks. So before they even taste it, they already love it. So um, always ensure that I get good packaging. I don't want anything spilled. You're not gonna get your boil or whatever you order looking like it turned upside down. Like, you know, it's all. So I try to ensure that I get proper um, containers for my food. They might be a little pricier than I don't want the regular lunch boxes. So I ensure that I got those because I wanted it to look good, taste good, smell good, everything. is on Instagram, Facebook, um, my number is out there, so um, person WhatsApp order, order through DM on Instagram, as well as direct message on Facebook. WhatsApp is 876-331-4188, my Instagram handle is Chris's Kitchen, K-H-K-H-R-I-S-S-Y-S, Kitchen, K-I-T-C-H-E-N, all one word. On Facebook, it's also Chrissy's Kitchen, but it's Chrissy hyphenated S Kitchen. Um. The COVID-19 effect, um, well, you started this year. Do you think right. COVID-19 has helped your business or have you gotten into any sort of challenges because of the new norm of doing business and getting um, products to your customers? Right, so for me, it might be different from from, from some, someone who had started a while back, but as I said, my business birthed from COVID somewhat, but I also felt the effect in the curfew hours. As I said, for Saturday, it's mainly um, persons pick up, but persons will come and they don't just pick up the food, but they'll stop, they'll drink a soup, you know, if they want to. I provided beers as well, so when the country was open, um, so persons can linger a bit, you know, persons were able to come and sit and have a drink and eat and just have a little chill vibe as I cook from home, but we have space, so persons um, were able to do that. The other day when the curfew hours changed, that kind of limited uh, the sitting and chilling. So persons, so that's where the effect is. But because I do delivery on Fridays, it's not such a big deal. And persons didn't mind coming to pick up. So I just had to cook earlier on a Saturday um, so that person can get it in time before curfew starts. Over in Trinidad and Tobago, National Security Minister Stuart Young says the government is acting within the law when dealing with immigrants, whether legal or illegal. During a weekly post-cabinet media briefing, Mr. Young referred to an article in a daily newspaper which suggested the government is breaking the law in dealing with immigrants. Ian Wason has more in this report. 
National Security Minister Stuart Young said even before the borders were closed, government has had to deal with the issue of illegal immigrants. He drew the example of last year when over 16,000 Venezuelans, some who had entered this country illegally, had to be registered. He said they have been treated according to the law, even in instances when it might have meant deportation, for example, when someone was caught breaking the country's laws. What has been happening within recent times with respect to illegal immigrants and those from Venezuela, we have been repatriating them in accordance with our domestic law. He said some have been registered by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the UNHCR could now place those persons in countries that would accept them. He added, even so, having a UNHCR receipt does not trump the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Young added the government also had to deal with the issues of lawyers, obstructing efforts to protect the country against COVID-19. We have had instances, whilst we are attempting to protect the population of Trinidad and Tobago and quarantine persons of lawyers going to court, the state not being represented because they're being heard ex parte, applications being made, persons being released, and afterwards we get the test results that these persons are positive for COVID. And of course, by now they've gone out in the population. They didn't come in here legally, so there's no proper recording. You don't know where they've gone, etc. Mr. Young assured government is acting in accordance with the immigration laws in handling of illegal immigrants. Ian Wason, TTT News. A new bug is attacking crops in Grenada. The Ministry of Agriculture and Lands has issued a statement about the pest that attacks soursop, plums, mangoes and other fruits and flowers. More from Cecile Axiel. The Ministry of Agriculture in Grenada this week issued a new pest alert. The Ministry said that a high infestation of scale insects have been observed on several plants which includes soursop, plums, mangoes and guavas among other crops. In that regard, agriculture authorities here in St. Lucia are currently in discussions with Grenadian counterparts to gather further information on the matter. I am not aware of the situation in Grenada. Um, I, you just called me to inform me of, of what's happening in Grenada. I call my research officer. Um, she also is not aware. Um, but she promised to call her counterpart in Grenada to get more information and following, of course, that discussion with her counterpart in Grenada, she'll be able to give some more in-depth information as to what the situation is like. But um, as far as they are concerned, they are not aware of any situation. The name of the pest is not yet made public in Grenada and an alert has not been issued for St. Lucia. However, St. Lucia Agriculture Minister Ezekiel Joseph said there should be concern taking in consideration Grenada's proximity and fruits that are endemic to St. Lucia. And that's why we have all the protocols to try and avoid um, that from happening and that's why we are calling on the general public to be mindful of the, the danger it can create if we don't go through with these protocols. So definitely um, as you are aware that um, the, the research department um, would, would do the initial investigation and will continue the protocols that we have been able to establish to avoid these things from happening. Our records are very good and when it comes to this, just that we have to get the full support of the general public in um, assisting us in managing whatever importation of unneeded deaths and diseases into our country. In addition, Agriculture Minister Ezekiel Joseph said that it is of utmost importance that the public follow protocols. The Ministry of Agriculture in Grenada said that scale insects feed on the sap of plants, resulting in poor growth as well as making the plants more susceptible to other diseases. Cecil Actil, NBC Prime. In sports, head of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, says the Tokyo Games could take place next year, even without a coronavirus vaccine, pointing to the success of the Tour de France. He struck an optimistic note at a meeting with the Tokyo 2020 organizers, where he vowed to make the postponed event a triumph. 
despite the uncertainties of the pandemic. Bach maintained that a vaccine and progress in rapid testing would facilitate holding the event. The 2020 Games were postponed earlier this year as the COVID-19 virus spread around the globe. This was what Bach said then. In order to uh, safeguard uh, their, uh, the health uh, of uh, the athletes and everybody involved in the Olympic Games and to make a contribution to the containment of uh, the coronavirus, uh, we agreed uh, to postpone uh, the uh, Olympic Games uh, Tokyo 2020 to uh, 21, latest uh, summer uh, 21. This is uh, the good news, but there is a lot of uncertainty remaining. An uncertainty for the entire humanity. We all are together in a very dark uh, tunnel and we do not know how long this uh, uh, tunnel is and uh, we do not know what is happening uh, tomorrow. But we want you know, this Olympic flame uh, to be a light at the end of uh, the tunnel. The Games are now slated for July 23, 2021. Organizers are insisting they will go ahead in some form and be safe for all involved. In the meantime, drug companies are racing to produce an effective counter to a virus that has now claimed more than 970,000 people around the world and infected almost 32 million. Several leading vaccine candidates are currently in late stage trials. And that's our package. Join us again tomorrow, same time, same place, for more news and sports right here on PPCJ, the People's Station.